Hello, I was going to make an intro commenting on the upgraded audio that we now have, but uh, the isolation booth for the new microphone didn't arrive, so you're stuck. Starting off the news this week, a report published in the journal Science has revealed a new exoplanet that astronomers say shouldn't exist if current theories are to be believed. It is a gas giant that orbits an M-type red dwarf, which is the most common star type in our galaxy. Previously, scientists believed that planets this size could not form around a star as small as this, as the star does not have the gravitational power to form such a massive object. The star, named GJ3512, is only 270 times more massive than the planet, named GJ3512b. And for comparison, our own sun is around 1,050 times larger than Jupiter. The scientists who published the paper offer an alternative theory as to how the planet formed, in contrast to how it is believed planets like this normally form. It is normally believed that planets of this size form from an ice core base, and gas around the newly formed star is attracted to the core, forming a planet. What has been suggested here is that the gas around the star collapsed and formed a planet because of its own gravity. However it was formed, this new planet has changed the rules and I'm sure further study could yield exciting new discoveries. In other news, the Amory Ice Shelf in Antarctica has given its largest iceberg since the beginning of the 1960s. The iceberg that has broken off now is called D28 and is a massive 1,636 square kilometres, bigger than the Greater London area. It pales in comparison to the one that broke off in the 60s though, which was an enormous 9,000 square kilometres in area. Scientists say that while there is much to be worried about within Antarctica, this particular event should cause no concern, and they have in fact been expecting it for many years. Starting off the paleontology news this week, a new paper has just been published that has re-examined estimates for the total length of the infamous Megalodon shark. Noting how the most commonly cited lengths for this fish are generally between 18 and 20 meters, this paper has looked at the growth stages of the teeth as well as the relationships between the total body length and height of the tooth crown in living white sharks in order to clarify what we currently understand about Megalodon's body size. The results found that upper front teeth were much better in being used to estimate body size than lower front teeth, and that at the moment the only scientifically supported maximum length estimates based on museum specimens are between 40 15.2 and 15.3 meters, not as large as some previous estimates, but still securing Megalodon as one of Earth's biggest super predators. And of course, as is always important to remember, some individuals could always have occasionally grown larger or smaller than this range. Also this week, a new study has been published determining the diets and feeding habits of ancient crocodilians. Generally, crocodilian ecology has been classified according to the shape of these animals' snouts, but it turns out that even amongst living members of the group, the reality is far more complicated, and that sometimes bite force and predation preferences don't vary that much between snout shapes. So, this new study uses mathematical modelling, phylogenetics, ecological surveys, and fossil feeding traces to better classify the function of snout shape across the entire group, including extinct members. This has allowed researchers to predict what certain extinct crocodilians could have fed on, and even identify cases of probable scavenging. In summary, it turns out crocodiliform morphology and ecological diversity has been underestimated. Finally, there's been a very interesting paper published recently that has examined the evidence for pain-associated behaviour in extinct dinosaurs. Reviewing the literature on this topic, and looking for reports of healed injuries on bones, as well as limping gaits or injured feet identified from fossil trackways, the researchers also studied behaviours in living birds and crocodilians to determine how non-avian dinosaurs may have responded to serious injuries. It's clear that many individuals suffered injuries that would have affected their lives greatly, and it seems likely that their rate of healing was probably faster in other reptiles, possibly due to their warm-bloodedness, and in the case of communally nesting dinosaurs, injured young could have been cared for. Additionally, dinosaurs that formed herds or packs could have provided aid for injured individuals, as they would be better protected and could be fed by kills that a pack made. This interesting study is apparently, at the moment, the first to look at pain behaviour and responses in dinosaurs. Thank you very much for watching this week's 7 Days of Science. I do hope you enjoyed it, and feel free to subscribe if you haven't already. And if you have, we'll see you on Sunday.